Good morning and welcome to, this is the final day, the third day, the final full day, I should say, of Professional Development Bootcamp for 2022. If you don't know me, I'm Corey Jo Biddle. I'm the Executive Director of Fuel Milwaukee, which is a community engagement organization for Milwaukee professional and Milwaukee region for professionals. It's also a community engagement and economic development initiative and affiliate of the Metro Milwaukee Association of Commerce where I serve as the VP of Community Affairs. Shout out to MMAC for supporting Boot Camp from the very first, when it was a thought, the idea of this, they supported it right away. So without MMAC, we would not all be here together. If this is, I mean, by now, a lot of you in here have been to uh, other Boot Camp sessions. Go to the chat, tell us what other Boot Camp sessions you've attended and what did you think? Thank you for being here with us this morning. By now, you know, Bootcamp is a multi-day conference, virtual conference this year. We have over 1,700 people that have registered for sessions this year. So doing this virtually is hard because I want to see you and I want us to go into all those cool spaces together and be in person. But I really kind of like the fact that we don't have to cut off registration and as many people as possible can attend the session. So thanks for being here. Thanks for spreading the word. Thanks for making this a success virtually this year. Appreciate that. So this is the first of three sessions that we're gonna to have today. And then we have a bonus session tomorrow. So if you think you can squeeze one more session in or you wanna check out the rest of the calendar, make sure you go to our website at fuelmilwaukee.org and check out the rest of the lineup. This again would not be possible without the community of employers and speakers and everyone who has donated their time and energy and talent to this effort. Marquette University's Graduate School of Man Management for many years now has been our presenting sponsor and they're back again as our presenting sponsor this year. The Graduate School of Management is home to nationally ranked part-time MBA and executive MBA programs, as well as world-class master's programs in accounting, applied economics, corporate communication, finance, management, supply chain. They also have graduate certificates and joint MBA programs with concentrations in law, political science, and nursing. So if any of that sounds good to you or you're interested, make sure you check them out. We'll drop their website in the chat. Of course, they're not hard to find. You can just Google Marquette University's Graduate School of Management. Thank you for being our presenting sponsor again this year. <clears throat> American Family Insurance. That was my best one yet. It's, it gets better each time I do it. <laughs> Returning and supporting sponsor is American Family Insurance. AmFam is well known for their corporate responsibility efforts and their passion for coming together with customers, employees, and agency owners to drive positive economic, social, and environmental change for our communities. Check out Amer American Family Insurance for all your insurance needs. Just visit them at amfam.com. New to the Bootcamp family as supporting sponsor is Mandel Group. Mandel has luxury apartment communities throughout the Milwaukee area, including downtown, Shorewood, West Dallas, Wauwatosa, Brookville, Hales Corners, Franklin, and Oconomowoc. No matter where you want to be in the Milwaukee area, Mandel has the perfect, beautiful apartment for you. I'm not just saying that. They really are very nice. If you've been inside one or you live in one of the uh, their apartments in any of the buildings, drop it in the chat. They really are very nice. If you're looking for a new community, a new home, check out mandelgroup.com to learn more. And lastly, our returning media sponsor is Radio Milwaukee. Through music, stories, created for a culturally open-minded community. 88.9 Radio Milwaukee is a catalyst for creating a better, more inclusive and engaged Milwaukee. Be sure to tune in at 88.9 for the radio station and visit radiomilwaukee.org. They have lots of really cool stories and music on their website too. Okay, now I want you to get comfortable. We want you to kind of pick, the, gal pick the, the view that feels good to you. Go in the chat and start talking to each other. Practice everything, right? Get comfy. When you have a question, an actual question that you want us to dis discuss or kind of pay attention to during the last 15 minutes of this event, put your questions in the Q&A. It's much easier for us to find them that way. 
if you're just talking to each other or you want to react or you just want to say, I know that's right, or I agree, me too, then you want to do all of that in uh, the chat space. I'm going to prompt you maybe to give us some feedback. Take over the chat, go crazy. If you have a question that you want us to look at, put that in the Q&A. Does that sound good? Okay. Now, the reason why we're here, our mentorship mornings have been so good. They're always good, but this year they've been really, really good. And it's very rare that <laughs> I have a chance to interview one of my friends in this way. So I am so excited to be talking to Gerard Blanks, the Chief Innovation Officer for Milwaukee Film. He's that and so much more. Uh, listen, his bio, you've all seen the bio. That bio is just scratching the surface, okay, to what this man <laughs> has been involved in and done and helped make successful in the Milwaukee region. Uh, Gerard is responsible right now for leading Milwaukee Film's audience, brand, and content development. He created Milwaukee Films Cultures and Communities Initiative to showcase diverse cultural experiences, perspectives, and representations through film and event programming. He actually started his career as a community organizer for Safe and, Safe and Sound. He also was an outreach coordinator for the Waukesha Homeless Shelter, the Braun House. And he was also a caseworker at uh, the Sojourner Truth House. He has a lot more that we couldn't put on there. We just, we don't have enough slide. We don't have enough time to talk about this man and his career. He has a bachelor's and master's degree in media studies from uh, UW Milwaukee and has recently earned his doctor, doctorate in philosophy and communication studies from Northwestern University. Is that right, G? Are you, are you actually a PhD now? Come off your, wait a minute. There, there we go. go. There we there go. We go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, no, 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 no. I am still, um, I'm still in this office every weekend trying to finish my dissertation. So I okay, am, okay, okay. Getting yeah. there, close. Yeah, yeah close. <laughs> so what are you doing? Like, what does that work like for you every day? Like, are you just writing all day? Are you researching? Like, what are you? What's the stage that you're in right now? Um, it's a it's a little bit of both. So. My, I came to Northwestern with dissertation in hand. Like I knew what I wanted my dissertation to be. That was actually, um, that was actually sort of a problem because I had stuck in my head, this is what my dissertation is going to be. You can't, this is it. You can't tell me nothing. Yeah. And it took a lot of maturing, soul searching, and just research to understand that what I came to Northwestern with was, I, I came with an idea. But that was really it. And my advisor, um, Bob Harriman, he really helped me understand like, no, this, this, you have a good idea. You have the start of something, but this ain't it. And over the course of years, I had to really adapt and adjust to what I'm doing now, um, which is when this, ooh, when this gets done. Uh, <laughs> but, but here's the thing though. I, I'm sort of in this weird stage of, typically at this stage, um, a dissertator would be writing. They've done most of the research. Now they're just writing and sort of putting together the pros. Um, I'm still doing some research just because, to be honest, I think I wasted a lot of time chasing a concept that ended up not being what my dissertation actually is. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Was that, do, does that make no, sense? No, no, listen, that's this whole, this, <laughs> listen, people in the chat, right, the participants, they're drinking coffee, they're leaning back, they're, they they want to know all this good, okay, this, all this right. is the juicy stuff, right? The, okay, <laughs> all you know, right. You know, we get in your business because there's people, now, who, who is thinking about pursuing a PhD, but is a little nervous, a little intimidated, go in the chat, tell us, and uh, if Gerard can give you some encouragement, you can, you can do it, just don't, see? I love well, warning, I can I can warn you about <laughs> what you're about to get into. <laughs> but it's a good warning. Get into it. Get in. See, look. See, people people are inspired by it. So, but, so we'll go through. I'm gonna go into your childhood oh. and your teenage years and your young adult years when I met you as a young adult, and then we'll talk about the work. But bef before I get into sort of your backstory. Talk a little bit about the work that you're doing with um, 
Milwaukee film, you know, I kind of, it's on the website and I share links and articles about you, but what is the way that you describe uh, your work and why it's important to you? I've, I've really been, that picture that you showed is, is I have a, maybe sometime we'll talk about my, uh, my issues with photography because I'm not, I'm not particularly good I do a lot of photo shoots and I don't know if I've liked a picture of me yet, but that picture is from the Shepherd Express piece that came out maybe a month or so ago. Mm -hmm. And, and in it, I, I, I really just talk about the fact that I'm still developing my elevator pitch or, or how I describe my position. Um, I do a lot of different things here at Milwaukee film. I think the best way to sort of think about it is, my sort of role is to constantly be thinking about how we can do things better. That's the innovation part of my title, okay. uh, but that really relates to reaching out to people that may or may not engage with us or engage our programming or come to the Oriental Theater or care. And so I'm always trying to think about how we can reach communities, how we can, um, how we can just take what we already do well, but maybe do it in new and different ways so that someone who didn't know that they needed us or wanted to engage now has a reason to. And, that, and, and, and there's so many things that come with that, right? And so uh, my background has been, I think, very, very beneficial for me in my role because the, the way that I grew up and, you know, the household that I grew up in and uh, the work that I did before I got here sort of trained me in terms of mind, body, and spirit um, to do the things I have to do. I, I can kind of explain that more later, but I just I come from a background where um, I come from a household raised by a single mother where it's just like, if it's got to get done, you do it, whether someone else is involved or not, you just, you just do it, you know? Yep. And from the beginning, so I think a lot of people think of the film festival, but a lot of the engagement comes around the programming. Yeah. It really, like, what's, what's your thinking about the relationship between the film festival, the programming, and how Milwaukeeans, um, you know, interact with the organization. If if you have been to any of the films or participated in the festival or programs, tell us in the chat while we're uh, while Gerard is responding to that. The film festival is a beautiful thing. Like that's how I came to Milwaukee Film. I'm I'm a bit of a film nerd, and um, I remember when I first found out about the festival, I was like, "Oh man, this is heaven on earth!" Right, and and I got I really nerded out because what I would do is it would be me, my wife, and my mother. Um, we would go to the films, but I would make a schedule. Like I would go in and like, you know, I was really, really serious about it. So I would go in the word and I'd be like, okay, this is what we got. These are the films Thursday times. This is what time I need you to, I'm going to come pick you up from work. Like I really got into it and organized the whole schedule around. And I did this for years. And then it was funny, I was writing for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. I was a freelance writer for them, but I was in the music section. So I had to figure out a way, how can I write about films when I'm really supposed to be writing about music? Mm -hmm. So I do reviews of all of the music films because the Milwaukee Film Festival okay. had uh, a category called Sound Vision. And so any film that was related to music, I would write about it. That's how I got my media pass. They should have never gave me a media pass. <laughs> I was coming to everything. I mean, it, yeah. I just, I love, love film. It, it, it was a part of my upbringing. Um, it was me and my mother, we, we did movies all the time. And so that's how I came to, to just know Milwaukee film. And that's how most people know us. In fact, a lot of people refer to us as Milwaukee Film Festival, right? That's uh, right. And there's a difference. There's a festival in the organization. But then beyond, I mean, let, let me just be real, like the... The demographic, you know, the audience, the typical audience member is white, you know, probably middle aged, uh, probably a woman, right? And so that's like nine, you know, 90 to 95% of the audience is white, which is what it is, right? But 
there was always this feeling that, you know, Milwaukee is 40% black, right? And it's a majority minority city. How can we reach these other communities? And that, and that was a, a sentiment way before I got here, right? Mm -hmm. So all I did, and, and obviously, you know, me, uh, what myself and Dr. McFadden, Dante, uh, the work we did together, all we did was simply use our connections into the community to basically say to folks in the black and brown in black and brown communities, hey, give this thing a try. Trust us, give this thing a try. And it went from the early days, for those of you that know Black Lens, the early days in 2014 and 15, us just kind of struggling. And I always tell the story, <laughs> CJ, about um, not being able to give the tickets away. I remember driving up, uh, rolling up on you and handing you like maybe three or 4,000 tickets. And say, all right, just throw these in the wind and see if anybody catches them. You know what I mean? Like my I was walking, listen, I was walking up to strangers. Like, do you know about the film? We gave away, so I mean, uh, we gave a stack to Renell Washington, who ended up being very, I mean, because it was just a good idea. People just didn't know. Yeah, and so we were we were hustling, but that hustle over the course of, and it will be eight years come this May, that hustle over the course of eight years has turned into something very special. Wow. And now, instead of just those two weeks out of the year, Milwaukee Film does programming all year round, and we focus a lot of the year round programming on different cultures and different communities, right? Because at the end of the day, film, it speaks to everybody, right? And so, yeah, I mean, it's it's one of my my proudest moments. At, I was proud to to just be asked to be a part of Black Lens, even when we didn't have a name. It wasn't even called Black Lens. But now to see the growth over eight years, it's like seeing a child. My daughter's ten and she's taller than my wife, and it's like, you <laughs> yeah. know, that's because how I feel it's about because Black Lens. It is just like, it's just like that. It's like in the beginning, this child is completely dependent on you and it is pretty much, you know, you created it from the beginning. It is, it appears as you defined it in your mind. And then as it matures and there's other influences and other people, I mean, now it's just, I mean, I look at what you all are doing now and I'm like, I don't know if, you imagined it to be what it is now. Maybe you did, maybe you had that vision, but I'm just blown away by it. Like, what was the thing that that took it from, you know, something you were working really hard on to like taking it over where like Milwaukee has really started to own it and get it. You know, come on, stop that. You know what it is. It's, it was Lorenz Tate, Love Jones. That was it. I was just, uh, we were at an event the other night and I did a little uh, backstory about how that event came to be, but you were there. I mean, like, the, people still talk about that to this day. And, and I don't know if there's, there's a whole backstory to this thing, but when I got here in 2014, I said, I remember it was myself, Dante, and the CEO, Jonathan Jackson, we were out to lunch, we were talking about Black Lens, what was it gonna be? And I said, just so y'all know, we got, we're, on, we're, we're on the clock. We got three years until the 20th anniversary of Love Jones. Literally, Dante was the only person within the organization that knew what Love Jones meant. It was me and Dante. We had to do this whole sort of over the course of three years, this whole sort of education around, and, and there's no reason for, if, if you're not a part of that community, there's no reason why you would know, right? Um, and so I think at first we just thought everybody knew how important Love Jones was. It's like, no, yeah. you gotta educate people. So for three years, we slowly, kept, you know, saying, hey, it's 2017's coming. And then when 2017 came, everyone around the country was were doing Love Jones events. So the pressure was on us to do something special. Mm. The idea was always to bring a cast member. But man, if you can get Lorenz Tate, he's like, he's like Denzel for a younger generation. So let, I, I dropped the uh, wiki reference to Love Jones in the chat for those who don't know, but like Lorenz Tate is like, um, at that time, it's like when that movie was hot, he was like our Brad Pitt. 
<laughs> in the black community. You know what I mean? Like he was like hot. He and he still is. I mean, he doesn't age, but he was in every movie. He was, like getting him to Milwaukee, huge. Like yeah. I mean, serious. It, it was it was huge and. I can't go into the whole backstory because it's a long thing, but it's just, it's funny how it all came together. But, you know, packing out the main house, for those of you that know, we have a thousand seater at the Oriental Theater. Packing out the main house was, was it, it was a sight to see. But it, it, here's the great part. People were so disgruntled before the movie started because mm. we don't have ushers, we don't have assigned seats. So the seating was crazy because people were saving a whole row for them and their family, right? Okay. People were just, it, there was this tension because everyone was excited, but trying to get, because people came out five, 10 deep, trying to get your whole crew together. And then we were debating, does he go out on stage and announce himself or do we hold off the mystery until after the film? We decided he's got to get out here and say something to calm the crowd. <laughs> When they heard his voice, people started screaming and then wow. everyone settled in and it was, I had to leave, but from what I heard from people, literally the entire film, like people knew every word mm -hmm. and they were talking to the screen. I mean, that's just one of those magical moments that almost didn't happen. There were a lot of people involved in making that event happen, but that was the turning point for Black Lens. After that point, you, you couldn't tell us nothing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You couldn't tell us nothing. And, and, I, and I'm gonna be honest, I kind of walked around the office with my chest poked out a little bit, like- the Peacocking a little bit? Yeah, like, all right, so now y'all gonna listen to me? Listen, but you have to have those moments and then they can see the power of community, like tapping into where people are passionate, what they're excited, the, the heartbeat of a culture and bringing them into Milwaukee film. Before we move on, for those who don't know, explain the concept of Black Lens, what is special about those uh, films, um, and what is special about that particular program in the film festival. Black Lens just came out of, again, a desire to bring more people of color to the theater, particularly Black folks, because like I said, this is a, this city is sort of unique and has 40% Black, right? And, um, I give so much credit to, to our CEO, Jonathan Jackson. It was the screening of The Inevitable Defeat of Mr. and Pete, which was directed by um, a, a local uh, homegrown, George Tillman, homegrown filmmaker who went to Marshall, my high school. Uh, and it was written by Michael Starberry, also from Milwaukee. Packed out the main house. The crowd was predominantly black. And I think that was the first time that Jonathan and Milwaukee film said, oh, okay, this is what we need to do. Mm -hmm. So Jonathan pitched, I wasn't with Milwaukee Film at the time, I was at the screening though, and the energy was electric. Jonathan pitches the idea to Dante, who was with Milwaukee Film. Dante and I go back to film school at UWM, so he calls, he hits me up, and I always love this story, he hits me up, Dry, would you want to be a part of something brewing at Milwaukee Film? Uh, it was this like, I was like, yeah, what, whatever this is, this sounds good. I'm in. Didn't hear from him for like three or four months. And then he hits me up like, <laughs> let's do a meeting. And it was, he, he gave me a little bit of what it was, but it was still mysterious. And I just remember going to the meeting and saying, whatever this thing is, I'm going to be a part of it because it's film. Yeah. And if it's Dante, okay. I kind of mm -hmm. think. And when I heard the pitch, I was like, say no more. Say no more, I'm, I'm all in. Um, so that's how it started in 2014. And we didn't, we just had eight films. There wasn't, we didn't have any special marketing for it. There, there was not, a, there was no budget. It was just, here you go, eight films. Remember, we brought Robert Townsend that first year. You were at the, <laughs> at the reception. And, you know, I was a little disappointed in the turnout for Robert Townsend, but looking back, well, we didn't have a mechanism really to, we didn't have a social media page. We didn't have anything. It was strictly word of mouth, emailing people we knew and calling people we knew and then hoping that they show, they, they would come. Now, if I had to do that event again, I actually reached out to him. I was trying to get him for Black History Month this year and okay. it wouldn't work. 
but I, I want to do that event over again because I know I could get five or 600 people to come see Robert Townsend now, you know, yeah. but it was so which film, fun. which, which film did, um, uh, was it at the Oriental? That, yeah. yeah Cause was, the, uh, the reception was right up the street. Yep. It was, uh, what is the first one? Hollywood shuffle. That's right. That's right. People yeah. were, and I remember people were in the audience mouthing all the words. Like, Would you well, be because, quiet? Because yeah, it was there. The it was interview. so classic. When yeah. that film came out, you knew all of the jokes in the film. And so yeah. Black Lens was founded on the idea of giving a platform to Black filmmakers. Black filmmakers, because a lot of films that deal with the Black experience, a lot of people don't know, aren't di uh, directed by Black folks. And so we wanted to give a platform to Black filmmakers, but also, to be quite honest, we wanted to create, uh, we wanted to showcase subject matter that Black people cared about, right? I mean, that's what this comes down to. You want to see your experience on the screen. Mm -hmm. You get so bad, you'll even go see bad depictions, stereotypical depictions, as long as you can see yourself. Mm -hmm. All Dante and I are trying to do is just make sure you see yourself in the way you want to see yourself. And, and that's the bad, the good, the ugly, but that's the beautiful thing about Milwaukee Film is we talk about it afterwards. Yes. Like, you know, any cinema can throw films on a screen, but who can have a community conversation around it like us? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the the programming, the discussions, all of that. It And the fact that the, all of the programming and the events, and I mean, I would tell anybody, the, the event, the Milwaukee film events, period, are some of the best that I have ever been, not just in Milwaukee, period. Just a high level of care, thoughtfulness, uh, just every element is just, when you walk into these events, you just feel special. You know, you just feel like part of something really big and special. So to have Black Lens and, um, and all the other programs, just bringing full, the full scope of Milwaukee's population and community into that experience, I think is really, it has been meaningful. CJ, that's that's what you know. Me, Dante, right now, we always talk. It's the, the experience. Sometimes, sometimes there's a we'll show a film that I don't love, but I think that the audience will will like it. And at the very least, we're gonna have a conversation about it. It is about the experience. Yep. Okay, so let's go back to our to your childhood. Are you a native Milwaukeean? I'm originally from Champaign, Illinois. Uh, okay. Moved here at five. Um, yeah, roughly around there. I don't know. My mother knows. I was like three, four, or five. I got here. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. and I've been here ever since. I I, I try and try to leave y'all, but just when I think I'm out, y'all pull me back in. Somebody in the chat got to know that one. Come on, <laughs> someone got to know that one. People are laughing. People, I mean, we but we all understand. We have, <laughs> Milwaukee has a magnetic, magical power. Tell us yeah. about your uh, your childhood. So you, it was just you and mom. Yeah, you know, like I know my daddy. Uh, I had a, I had a, I, I had a, I've had a, I've had a relationship with my father my whole life. But it was me and moms. Moms mm -hmm. on the Shaka Khan and Anita Baker. <laughs> Mom's was uh, the disciplinarian and the nurturer. Mom's is the greatest influence. Mom's is my my advisor, my conciliary. I go to her uh, for advice. It was me and mom's, yes. And I'm not an only child. I have a brother and two sisters, but I didn't okay. get them. So it's it's this weird thing of. Okay. But yeah, I fit, I grew up an only child basically. Uh, what so listen when I when I first took over fuel it happened abruptly and I was not ready <laughs> mentally for it and uh, I was talking to Element your wife mm -hmm. Element and she said you got to talk to Gerard's mom <laughs> and I had a meeting with her where I was like she gave me some of the the realest doses of look get it together and do what you got to do I was like I wanted to be babied a little bit and she was like uh. -uh. No, no, no. This is what we gotta do. What if what have what have you learned the most from her, from from her? Like, what have you picked up from her that that stands out the most? She was always right, always. I was saying this to somebody yesterday. I, I tried to buck through all my teen years, like everybody else. She was always right. 
Never mm -hmm. wrong about anything. Every bit of advice she gave me was right. She would tell me, I would complain about a class. I'm like, look, ma, I don't need this class. I'm gonna be a filmmaker. I'm gonna be whatever, whatever. I don't, what, what do I need with geometry? Which I flunked. Um, <laughs> she'd be like, dry, play the game, play the game. Go to class, get there on time, sit in the front, raise your hand occasionally, do, do, do your homework and you get a B. I don't care if you like the class. If you don't think you need it, fine. Get your B and get out. Mm -hmm. and, but mom, she'd be like, no, 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 no. Play the game, right? And she was giving me game off. And I took a little, but I didn't take enough. Yeah. She told me this great story about her and my uncle. My uncle passed away a few years ago. And she would tell me this great story, right? About she would argue with her father, my grandfather, all day long about something because she knew she was right. She said, she was like, but your uncle, Tony, he would just nod and say, okay, daddy. And then go off and do whatever he wanted. Because he realized, I don't got to argue with him. I just got to make him feel secure that he's right. But I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And she, she said, over time, she realized, not everything is a fight. Not mm. everything is an argument. Take in what you need to take in. Make, reassure, make people feel like they're being heard. But at the end of the day, you got to go do what you got to do. And she was trying to teach me the game. And I swear it took me 40 years, 40 years. And sometimes I'll, I'll tell her that. And she'll just give me that. Yeah, I know. I know it. Yeah. Like now you, got, you got three kids of your own. So now you going, now you get to go through it. <laughs> now you get to see. <laughs> I feel like I'm turning into my mother more and more every day. I'm like, it actually, it actually does happen. It's just that, that cycle. And, she, and my mom was right too. What did you, so you, did you, when did you know you were going into, because I'm, when I met you, I associated you with music. Mm -hmm. So there obviously was, you were a Renaissance child from the, from the beginning. Tell us about your music influences, your film influences. How did you develop the desire to even be in this world of media? Well, I mean, I grew up in, I mean, every Black child kind of knows this story, right? Like, especially, you know, like, you either grew up with your moms and your pops or like me, I grew up with my mom. So you wake up Saturday morning, mom's is cleaning the house and there's this smell of like this mix of pine saw. And I think at the time I might've been eating pork. So she was maybe making bacon and sausages, that beautiful mix of the two. And Shaka would be on or Ashford and Simpson. And I remember just soaking this up. Like Anita Baker just spoke a language that I thought everybody knew, right? And so growing up, my mother just, like, it was just a part of my household. Music was every, it was just every day. And it was, it was, it was a way of teaching, right? Like, um, it, 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 I just gravitated to it because there was something about the way that uh, a great, like Luther could say something in a way that would make you feel like someone understood you. Mm -hmm. And um, the people, people that know me know that I am a, a, a Tupac historian, right? Because uh, okay. growing up, I really resonated with Tupac's story, right? And so music's always been a part of me. Film came later, though, because it wasn't until maybe middle school that I realized every day what I wanted to, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? Every day it would change. One day it was like, I want to be a firefighter. No, I want to be a paramedic. No, I want to be an African-American history. One day it dawned on me. Everything that I had ever sort of articulated uh, or, or thought of being when I grow up, which is sort of an interesting term, um, every career that I ever thought of came from a movie. Like I was like, wait, I want to be a sensei. I want to be a karate master because I just watched Karate Kid for the 30th time. Or I want to be a firefighter because I just watched this film. And it was like, you don't want to be all these things. You want to be a creator of worlds, of fantasies, a few. Mm -hmm. I, I want to be a director. And so I remember Zer James Earl Jones and Soul Man. Not a particularly great movie. Not one of my favorite movies. Soul Man is, is complicated. But I remember seeing him and, that, and hearing that big booming voice. And in the movie, he was an African-American history professor. And I was like, I want to be like him. One, he reminds me of my uncle. And two, look at him, right? 
So over time, I realized, oh man, I'm seeing the world through the movies I see. And like I said, me and my mom, we went to the movies every rep. And I, <laughs> I joke sometimes and say, I probably saw a few movies, you know, <laughs> because back during the 80s, I don't know if we had the PG-13. So it was like, you had PG and then you had R. And I went to see a few movies that was probably above my, um, you know, what I should have yep. been at the time. But that's mm -hmm. what I got into it. Like, like I said, my mother gave me the music in the household and then she took me to the movies on the weekends and those became my two loves. So, um, you, so you recognize that and went to college and majored in what? Uh, Wait, no, well, okay. Let me give you a chance to explain the jump because it wasn't right away. What was the progression from graduating from high school? Let's start in high school. You graduated from high school in what? Uh, belligerence. I mean, I was I was not a particularly good student. I I got my first 3.0 my last semester of school in high school. Um, I don't know. My focus was media, though. That was the great thing about Marshall. I had a teacher named John Holmes, mm -hmm. who was a nationally recognized um, teacher. Like I said, George Tillman went to Marshall. So I left thinking, okay, I've learned a little bit about media and journalism, broadcasting. Boom, I'm going to go to UWM, and I'm going to set the world on fire. I also was track, uh, a track athlete. I was all state in track. So I got a track scholarship. Yeah, Ronell come see me I, and, and I'm doing no four miles. Come see me on that 100 meter dash in like a year or two when I get back in shape. But I got a track scholarship to UWM and UWM is one of the top film schools in the country. A lot of people don't know that, right? So this was a perfect marriage for me. And then when I got there, um, I kind of got a little distracted with, we started <laughs> this student organization called Scope and that changed my life. And yeah, I got off track again. What was scope? Scope, oh, you don't know the scope story. Long story short, um, this is this is the story of my life. I went to an open mic that the uh, Black Student Union was holding. I was mesmerized because remember, this is the mid '90s. This is the Love Jones era. Spoken, mm -hmm. the brothers up there doing their thing, and I'm like, whoa, yes. <laughs> I'm like, what, what? Well, the snaps is one part of the scene. But there's yeah. another competitive, like, hip-hop, I go at it, spoken word part of the scene. And mm -hmm. I went mean, into both of those, and it was like, this is amazing. So I go to the BSU, and I say, yo, I want to be a part of this. That open mic, trust me, I can make it better. Just let give me the wheel. And it was like, nah, we, we cool. We, we got 35 people. That's We cool with that. I was like, really? I go home, and I'm all dejected. And my, my girlfriend at the time, Janina... Uh, she's sitting on the couch at, my, at, at the crib. You know, people so comfortable. People, half of my girlfriends really love, we were in relationships, they were in relationships with my mother. Mom. So mm -hmm. I come home, she had mom's crib sitting on the couch. She's like, you know, we can just, we can do this ourselves. It's like, what are you talking about? You can just start a student organization and just, we can do open mics. That's kind of how Scope got started. Me, her, and Dante. We recruited some other people. Long story short, by year two, I think I was 19 when I got my first Bader grant for $10,000. The next year it was $40,000. The next year after that, Bader gave us another 25. We got $75,000 as college students from the Bader Foundation. We got the largest grant allocation in school history. I think it's still the largest. We got $150,000 from UWM. Um, I was like, we were like 1920 and we had a budget of a few hundred thousand dollars. Crazy. And we were doing events. It was Black Lens before Black Lens. Like that's how, um, I didn't know Jonathan at the time, but he was at UWM at the time. And we oh. did a film series. We did, we brought Maya Angelou. Uh, we brought Common. We was just doing everything, right? And so for three, uh, three or four years, like, I was just running around campus, not going to class, doing this thing called Scope. It was student creative outreach, providing entertainment slash education. And we did some of the biggest events in the city, but I think our legacy in a lot of ways was that open mic, because a lot of great artists came through UWM's campus 
the Adis and Growing Nations and Muhibs and Kwabna, all these people merged around this, this experience that we had created at UWM. So was that Lyrical Sanctuary or did it? it yeah, that's where it started. So mm -hmm. what Dante did is after uh, UWM politely asked me to leave, uh, well, no, it was a mutual breakup. You know, it was like, hey, this ain't working out. Let's just part ways. So after I left, Dante then took what we were doing through the open mics. And this is kind of brilliant. He flipped it into having the university social cultural programming take over the open mic series. Um, and then I believe he's the one that came up with Lyrical Sanctuary. And so next month, it'll be 20 years. years. And, and so it, I, what's, I think what's so interesting is like all three of you now still work, like are really working in this because you're the girl, the woman that was your girlfriend at the time. Is she working at Netflix or something? Or something? Yeah, <laughs> then, uh, she's the head of Black Entertainment at Amazon. And, and it's, okay, Amazon. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of, an, for Amazon Studios, it's kind of annoying, you know? I, like, you was just sitting on my couch talking about, but yeah, she, she, she's a Don, she's a boss. But she, see, that, I think that is just so exciting because we all have these ideas. I mean, even now, it's like a, conversations we have about things that would be good ideas or, you know, things that could be movies or books or programs or events or anything. And when you actually put energy and effort towards it, it takes you in this whole other, like you really have to run with your ideas. You have those ideas for a reason. Imagine if y'all hadn't done that. Well, here's the thing. Um, I was once in a meeting and I was talking about my experiences at uh, Milwaukee Film. And I said, you know, I was kind of naive in the beginning and I made a lot of mistakes. And Jonathan said, yeah, but that's how all the great things get done is, you're naive, you don't know that something can't be done. And that's always been my attitude. I've always been the guy like, but, but man, we can make this better or let's do it like this. It's, I mean, like in middle school, I did, like this started early in middle school, did Black History Month plays because my mother wrote a Black History book. She never published it, uh, but she wrote a history book with Black History and she broke it down and have, we actually have an app now because me and her, we, me, her, and my wife have our, our, a company, and it's Black history questions, right? Hundreds and hundreds of them. So she wrote the book, said, ah, I'm not going to do anything. Oh, let me break this down and make it into a trivia contest, um, so on and so forth. That's how, in middle school, I started coming into knowledge of self, and so, again, I was like, we need to do a Black history play. But we ain't doing it in February because, you know, I was young and I thought that was cool. I said, we're going to do it in April. And we did two Black History plays. Well, lo and behold, once I get to UWM, I create this thing called Woodson Week. And it is a week of Black history and culture. Again, it's that Black lens before Black lens, right? And so, so yeah. So uh, you, you got a little off track with scope, even though it was still, I mean, it was still in your, it was school, but it wasn't school. Yeah, but it, it, it wasn't the school I, uh, <laughs> I was paying for, you know? Um, so I had a track scholarship, I had a track scholarship that paid the tuition and fees and all that, but I, I quit my senior year because I, I just, I didn't have the passion to run anymore. Mm -hmm. And I was so into scope and I stopped going to, I was, it had consumed me and, you know, I ended up dropping out. So yeah, it was, it was a school of hard knocks, but it was like, you know, man, we're not giving you credit for scope. Right. Right. Is that your personality? Like, do you get consumed in the things that you're focused on or that's, that's uh, just you? As, <laughs> come on now. Ask, <laughs> ask anyone that knows me well, particularly my family. I, um, I have an obsessive um, personality, but it's, it's, it is not something, it is, it is just who I am. There's nothing I can do about it. When I, when I become intrigued or enamored with something, when I get pulled in, once you get me, when, when I'm all in, I'm all in. And that means 24 seven. That means I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm thinking about, man, I, but if we do it this way, okay. But I, the color of those chairs, I just can't do white chairs. Those chairs should be black. 
there's this great story. You know Maureen, right? My colleague, mm -hmm. Milwaukee Film. It's a great story. We're having one of our groove theaters, right? And sold out. It's going to be several hundred people. I'm in the VIP section for 45 minutes just arranging the chairs. That's all I'm doing for 45 minutes because I need for everyone's sight line to be perfect. And the way that the, I'm, I'm like, okay, we got too many chairs, too many tables. How do I fix this so that everyone can see the stage? Now, of course, 45 minutes I, I spend on this. Of course, when people get up there, they move the chairs around, they do whatever they want. So I wait, but I don't care. All I care about is I got to make this experience perfect. Whatever it is, I got to make it perfect. That's just who I am. I totally get that. All right, so you drop out of track. What about school? No, I wasn't doing nothing. I, <laughs> I, I left UWM. And that's okay. part of, of my journey because I regretted it. It was 10 years that it took me 12 years to get back, but I feel like there was this lost decade. I did a lot of stuff during that time, but there was always this regret that I didn't, I, I didn't finish. And so I had to go back. What did you do in that, in that space? Uh, I started managing a band called Black Elephant. Got kind of big. I mean, we were almost there. We were on the verge of, you know, I'm, I, we were, I was talking to record labels and there was this big buzz around us. We toured a lot. At the height, you know, we making four or $5,000 a gig, and which was pretty good for a, a local band. Yeah. And so I just went all in on Black Elephant. That's how a lot of people, it's funny because people know me, there's like three or four different Gerard's out in the world. <laughs> so, you know, Milwaukee Film Gerard, you know, maybe Gerard from Scope UWM, you know, Gerard from The Journal. A lot of people know me, Gerard from Black Elephant. And so I did that for 10 years and that was a great time and I, I wouldn't trade that time for anything in the world, but you know, I, I, I that was awesome. I mean, we, like black elf. That's so. I was, I met Dante McFadden because I was then running the Black Holocaust Museum, and mm -hmm. he was like helping us out with programming, and we were talking about Black Elephant and what was going to happen, and you know, people were very excited and very proud of everything that you all um accomplished so i you know it could have you could have done something different but that was a big deal that was a that was a good break i'll say yeah <laughs> yeah you could have I mean, been uh, doing something different <laughs> yeah and i'm and i'm proud of that time i just the it was the regret of not finishing school that really drove me to the place that i am academically now yeah focus Super focused. I got a question in the QA. I'm going to jump to this. Uh, this is Michael. He says, I love Milwaukee film. They have great, a great design and great mission. The Oriental Theater is my favorite place to watch a film. That's nice. I've heard that they are looking to change their name. And how did community engagement play into this decision? Is that true? Okay, I got to be careful with that one. That's actually okay. a, great, okay. a great question, Michael. I actually... <laughs> Uh, I was just talking to Jonathan about this yesterday because someone else reached out about this. Um, I, I want to be careful because we are in the beginning stages of interrogation and investigation. So basically what happened was um, this has been a discussion, you know, sort of brimming for years, right? And Jonathan and I were talking one day and I said, we were talking about this, about this idea, right? And he said, yo, we should make that an event during Cultures and Communities, our Cultures and Communities Festival in September. So I was like, oh, okay. So I grab a few colleagues, Maureen, Kara, and I, and I say, hey, we should do, Jonathan wants to do an event around the name, right? I don't know what this looks like, but let's talk about it. So this is the key to what I do in my team, Ronell, Dante, Maureen, what we do at Milwaukee Film. And this is what I think sets us apart. We instantly go to the community. We call up the people. We got our team together. We got Sherry Tran. We got Ron Karamoto. We got uh, we got Lorna. So we had uh, representation Hmong community, Chinese, Japanese, and we said, "Hey, this is what we're thinking about doing. Tell us how sh how should we put this together?" And we had this amazing talk, and out of that 
Kara went and designed the program. And so we did this talk. We, we brought in a scholar from, I think it was Cal Berkeley. She talked about the history of Orientalism. And there's a long history in film of fetishization, a word I can never pronounce. Uh, <laughs> right? But of Orient Orientalism, there's a long history in film. We also brought in Adam Carr, who is a local historian, right? A lot of you know Adam as a journalist. And he talked about the history of the Oriental, the decor. So we had this really amazing event. And you can go to our YouTube page. It's up on our YouTube page where we talked about the name, the decor within the building, and also just the history of Orient, Oriental, 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 Oriental. Orientalism. Yes. I can't <laughs> speak today for some reason. Long story short, this is the beginning of a process that's going to go on for some time. We're going to have a community events, community forums, and at some point, we are going to take that information and do something with it. I just want to be careful in saying, when you say we're changing the name, next thing you know, people are like, when? Okay, I got a name. Yeah. All right. <laughs> come on. Come on, Milwaukee Film. Y'all got to do it now. And it's like, this is going to be a part of a process. Good question. If you guys have more questions, go to the Q&A. Gerard, if you can go back to your 20-year-old self and give yourself some advice. <laughs> drive, drive slow, homie. Another A, hey, another reference. You know, like me and my wife, we speak in, in, in hip hop, like in our house, every, we talk in the hip hop language, everything's hip hop <laughs> quote, right? Or a movie quote. So I would say, drive slow, homie. Why are you in a rush? Slow down, take care, get done with school, right? Mm -hmm. You know, don't be such a hothead. Don't be, don't rush to do everything. You know what I mean? Just, just slow down a bit, be patient. I was really, I was wildly immature um, because I was just like, I just had to go. I just had to get out of the bed every morning and go. Mm -hmm. Slow down a bit, you know? and. Wow. and that's what I would have told my 20 year old self and my 30 year old self, I, I grew, I felt like I just became this, this whole other person with my daughter being born in my thirties. And so it was like, that was the time where it was like, oh, oh, I gotta get serious. No more of this. You can't just be out here wild and, 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 and just doing whatever you want. You gotta, you gotta, you are responsible now for another human being. So I think in my 30s is when I really felt like I came into an understanding of what it meant to be responsible and to I I can't just do whatever I want to do anymore. At the same time, there I do have some regrets. Um, there's some decisions that if I had to do over again. I, I would have, and and I'm okay with that. I I love I live with regret. Regret is a part of of how of what motivates me, you know. I, I just CJ, I was just moving too fast and not sometimes. And there's relationships. There's there's people that I don't have relationships with now that I feel like I should have I should have been more careful with that relationship. You know, I, I felt like. I'm an acquired taste. My humor. Are you? Yes. Yes. Like I am. I just always liked you. You know, I think by the time I got, by the time I got to know you, it was, it was mostly because of Black Lens. So you had probably been through a lot. I mean, you learned a lot and been able to apply a lot, but my impression was like, this guy really understands relationships and people. And I like that you um, never said too much. Well, so so that's the thing. There is <laughs> like even if you're thinking it, it's like uh, you would give it a chance. You would watch and observe. I just always thought this. There's a lot of wisdom in this person for him to be so young. It's there. There's you know it's the duality. There's there's you know more than one side to a person. What someone what someone thinks is charming or what someone thinks is appealing, other people think. Why is this guy not talking? <laughs> you know what I mean? Or uh, why is this guy so serious? Or did he really just say that? 
<laughs> you know what I mean? So I guess for me, if I, you know, if I would, if I could go back to that, the twenties and thirties, I would have taken more time. There are some relationships that I would have sometimes communication, like it doesn't it all come down to communication Always. telling someone something or showing them something. And so being able accountability is I've learned that. I didn't have it in my twenties. It was always someone else's fault or blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. Now it's like, I am, I'm so accountable for who I am, what I do, what I say. Um, and I just, I learned that over time, you know? I love that. Okay. So I'm going to ask the final question uh, to Gerard really about what, what we can look forward to from Milwaukee film. And as I'm asking that, I want you guys to go to the chat. If there was anybody that you would like Gerard and his team to try to get to Milwaukee for the film uh -oh. festival, who would it be? Put it in the chat. I mean, I don't care. There's money's no object. Okay. Oh, I just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's honestly, that's how I used to think. I just I'm want so you to go there. Who do you want to see on the stage in Milwaukee? Put it in the chat. Um, now, stop it. You, you know. I, I love when Ronnell does this. Issa Rae, you know how hard it is to get Issa Rae. Hey, that, look, the second that, second that. Okay, somebody said, let's bring Robert Townsend back. You know, I'm, we, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to do that. You know, I hung out with him. Robert and I hung out with him after we met, and we're friends on Facebook. So maybe I can get him for you. I mean, I'll, I'll see. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we took I, shots I together. It was awesome. Yeah, I, <laughs> I would love, I'd love to get him back. Yeah, that would be, I think that would be it because it wasn't, the energy around it was there. You could bring him back and people, it would explode. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Another Easter right? Angela Bassett. Woo. See, now I'm going to get Regina King. Oh, Regina King. Yes. Okay. What's happening? What can we expect? What are, what dates should we know about? What should, what website should we be going to? So Black History Month, our Black History Month program, and this is the fourth year we're doing it. Uh, it starts next week, Tuesday, with our creative collective. We're doing a mixer. We're just bringing creative folks like yourself, entrepreneurs, people that are just out here doing their thing. We're bringing them together uh, to have a conversation and to network, introducing people to one another. It starts with that, but then every week we've got a film. Every week we've got an event. You go to our milwaukeefilm.org website, or you go to the Black Lens page, and you'll find all the information you need. And then be, so after that, we then move, we transition to Women's History Month. And we've got a bunch of great films and a bunch of great events. One event in particular, I'm just gonna tee up, can't talk too much about, we're doing a, a Black Maternal Health Symposium for, if you don't know, Black Maternal Health, Black mater, more, Mortality Rates. Um, you know, the United States has the highest Black mortality rate in the world. This is one of the number one issues for healthcare providers around the country. And so we're gonna do a symposium where we're taking film. We actually have a lot of great films on um, black maternal health. We're gonna be taking film, creating discussion and our guest speaker, I think I can say this cause she's confirmed. So it ain't Issa Rae right now, but it's close. Issa Rae adjacent. It's Christina Elmore, the sister that plays Condola on Insecure. I love her. She's a black maternal health advocate. So she's going to come speak about her advocacy, also her depiction on the show and how the personal connection she had with that character because she just had a baby. Yes. So see how we yeah. bring film and television and that's what we do. And then in April is the big boy, uh, Milwaukee Film Festival. You know, it's in April. OK. Yeah, it's in April now. April 20 in person in person. And, okay. and, and it's going to look a little different because we're still we're still doing this whole pandemic thing that y'all love so much. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's going to look a little different, but it is going to be in person. Um, and then from there, we, we've got a whole second half of the year. How can people get like, can they get on the mailing list, um, go to the website and get on the mailing list? Like, how can they just be in the mix and just like get text messages or something like how, what's the Easy. best way to know what's going on? You, you like the Milwaukee Film Facebook page or you like the Black Lens or follow us on social media. But then also, um, if you know any of us, me, Dante, right now, 
always just drop us a line. But there's a lot of different ways. You can go to our website and there's a way to sign up for our mailing list. There's just so many ways. Trust me. Trust me. Um, you Once you get in contact with us, we never let you go. <laughs> we will never let you go. <laughs> so get in contact with us and we will bother you till the end of time. <laughs> till the end of time. Thank you so much. I am so glad to know you. I'm so glad that you are a part of my network. And I am, I'm really, I'm really glad to have been even a small part of Black Liz. When I tell you those meetings in those days were some of the most, I would look forward to them. I looked forward to being around you guys and talking and laughing and just creating. And it was a lot of fun. And that that was largely because of your leadership and because you let us. <laughs> just come up with crazy stuff and do it and it actually worked and it was yeah. awesome so thank you thank you for that thank well, you for doing this too well no it's an honor you know um i have always admired your work um i i want to say i think you know that but i shouldn't assume that so if you don't know that i am i am a big big fan of yours and when we've called on you uh over the years uh you have always been there so uh, you, you know, you, you got the bat phone, you just put the signal out and I will be there. Uh, and it's not just me, it's me, Dante, the whole team. We, we support the work you do. So anytime, anywhere you need us, just call on us. Let's keep doing that. Great work. All right. We had, uh, there's lots of love notes in the, in the chat. I'm going to make sure I download the chat and send it to you, Renell, so you can see all of the Easter Ray. It's not just him. That wants her. Everybody does. Everybody's yeah. <laughs> we'll well. Doing everybody this. should pitch in then. Let's let's. I, kind of have you know what? <laughs> everybody needs to talk to their companies. We yeah. can get some sponsorships. We can get some. Hey, let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> Renell said, "Pass the collection plate. Let's get yeah. this in Milwaukee. That would be amazing. So let's do it. Let's do it." Thanks, Gerard, again, and thanks to all the participants. You make this a lot of fun with your activity in the chat. Don't forget, we have two more sessions today and a bonus session um, on Friday that I hope to see uh, a lot of you at on Friday. That's going to be a lot of fun. All right, get to work. <laughs> thanks, Gerard. Bye, everybody. Thank thanks, Mickey. <laughs> thanks, Karen.